therapy infection with a special interest in antiretroviral therapy. Professor Molina is chair of the clinical trial group and chair of the antiviral committee of the ANRS, the French National Agency for AIDS Research, where multi-centre clinical trials are reviewed and implemented in France. He has been the principal investigator of many clinical trials in HIV-infected patients uh, with the ANRS. Today he'll discuss the new research um, entitled Photon 2 trial. Thanks. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as it was just said, I will present this afternoon the first results of the Photon 2 study, uh, a trial in HCV HIV co-infected individual that was carried out in Europe and Australia. And the focus of the study was to assess an interferon-free regimen for the treatment of HCV infection. Uh, in recent years, interferon was part of all treatment regimens for HCV infection, but that's a drug which is uh, associated with a number of adverse events. And the study I will present this afternoon is an interferon-free regimen combining sofosbuvir, which is a new drug from Gilead Sciences, uh, uh, an S5B polymerase inhibitor that has a potent pangenotypic activity against all HCV genotypes. And that is combined with rubavirin, which is a drug well known for the treatment of HCV infection. And using these two drugs in combination for 12 to 24 weeks, according to the different genotypes, you can achieve a cure rate uh, which is pretty impressive, above 80% in all these patients. And what's interesting with this regimen as well is that there is no significant drug-drug interactions with the HIV drugs, and that's an issue for patients co-infected with HIV and HCV to have an HCV regimen that could be used in combination with their anti-HIV drugs. The safety of the regimen was also pretty good, and only 3% of the participants had to discontinue their treatment for HCV because of adverse events. So that's also an important finding of the of the study. And therefore, we have now, uh, since the first period is approved in many countries in the world, a dual combination that is potent and well tolerated for the treatment of HIV, HCV co infected individuals. So that's a new combination that is worth considering for the treatment of those patients. I think I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions on the study. We'll take questions all at the end. We'll take questions all at the end. Um, I'll introduce Professor Mark uh, Sulkowski now. Um, Professor Sulkowski served as medical director of the Viral Hepatitis Center at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. In addition, uh, Professor Sulkowski has been principal investigator for numerous clinical trials related to the management of viral hepatitis, including novel agents. He is co-investigator for adult patients at the Johns Hopkins site of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, NIDDK, Hepatitis B Clinical Research Network, as well as the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Adult AIDS Clinical Trials Group. This afternoon, he will present Turquoise 1, uh, another Hepatitis C um, study. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, the findings we'll present later this afternoon. Uh, continuing the same theme, the area of hepatitis C therapeutics is moving quite rapidly, and over the next uh, six months in many regions, we anticipate additional drug approvals. The Turquoise 1 study investigated the safety and efficacy of a three drug combination plus ribavirin in patients with HIV and hepatitis C co infection. This regimen includes a protease inhibitor known as ABT450, which is boosted by the HIV drug ritonavir, co-formulated with an NS5A inhibitor known as ombidesvir. Those three drugs are a single tablet taken once daily. It's given along with a non-nucleoside NS5B polymerase inhibitor known as desabuvir, taken twice daily. In this study, they were also given ribavirin the study tested the efficacy and safety of this regimen in 63 patients with well-controlled HIV infection on antiretroviral therapy. Patients were randomized to 12 or 24 weeks of treatment. 
the patients enrolled were a stable group of patients per protocol. They were on regimens that included valtegravir or the HIV-1 protease inhibitor atazanavir. Uh, if they were on the atazanavir regimen, the boosting of atazanavir was done with the three-drug combination. It, these patients uh, were treated again for 12 or 24 weeks, and the 12-week treatment group uh, were presenting the SVR-12 time point, which is no detectable virus 12 weeks after stopping therapy. And in this group, 93.5% were HCV RNA not detected. In the group treated for 24 weeks, we're presenting uh, full data on SVR4, four weeks after stopping treatment, and there it's approximately 97%. Uh, overall, out of 63 patients, there were only three patients who did not achieve virologic response that was durable. Uh, there was one virologic relapse, one virologic breakthrough for hepatitis C, and one patient that withdrew consent. No patient stopped because of side effects, and there were no serious adverse events over the 12 and 24 weeks of dosing. So this represents part one of a larger study, and part two of the Turquoise One trial will begin enrollment later this year. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Sukowski. So, certainly remarkable findings in hepatitis HIV co-infection, and moving to another um, co-infection, HIV TB. We've got two speakers from the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development, known as the TB Alliance. I'll introduce them both um, before they speak. So, Dr. Mel Spiegelman is the President and CEO of the TB Alliance. Uh, before becoming President in 2009, uh, Dr. Spiegelman served five and a half years as the Director of Research and Development at the TB Alliance. Uh, Dr. Bergman previously spent a decade managing the drug and R&D at Knoll Pharmaceuticals, a division of BASF Pharma. Um, Dr. Spiegelman was the recipient of the American Cancer Society Clinical Oncology Career Development Award 1985 to 1988. We also have Dr. Dan Everett, uh, who serves as the Senior Medical Officer and works in the clinical development of products in the TB Alliance portfolio. Prior to joining the TB Alliance, he spent 10 years in Johnson & Johnson's pharmaceutical sector. Just prior to joining TB Alliance, Dr. Everett spent a month as volunteer physician working in mission hospitals in Kenya. This afternoon, they'll be presenting um, a, a study, uh, which is a phase 2B study known as NC002, uh, that uh, tests a regimen called PAMZ. Great. So, um, thank you very much. I yeah, I think I don't need no, that. Do. It sounds like this thing. Oh, yeah. for the TV. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, loaded here with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we're here to present the results of the novel three drug combination regimen that Suman referred to uh, that we call PAMZ. But, you know, before we go into yeah. that, um, what I really wanted to do was also put this trial into perspective to try to explain what the potential is to really change the landscape of um, TB therapy. Um, realistically, because most people don't really have a good feel for the problem of tuberculosis, let me just give you a few facts. Um, there's about two billion people, billion with a B, who are actually infected with the TB um, mycobacillus. And of those, about 1.3 million die every year from the disease. Um, it's one of the foremost killers of women, um, among the top ten killers of children. Um, and clearly, uh, one of the reasons for being here is because of the deadly synergy between TB and HIV. Um, TB now, I think, is the leading killer of H, uh, patients with HIV. Um, I think approximately 20% of HIV-related deaths are now due to TB. So certainly, while more patients are living with TB, um, a good percentage of those actually uh, living with HIV, a good percentage actually died from TB. Um, what are the issues around TB? Um, TB treatment is unfortunately uh, very long um, and um, can be very toxic. For example, the treatment of multidrug resistant TB um, requires two or more years of treatment. And the therapy is toxic by TB standards, at least it's expensive, and even then it's only about 50% effective. Um, Within MDR therapy requires six months um, of daily injections um, and along with thousands and thousands of pills over the course of um, treatment. 
And side effects can be irreversible, including things like um, irreversible hearing loss. Um, the costs for the drugs alone can run into the thousands of dollars, and, and clearly that's not um, doable, especially in the poor countries. Um, and if you look at countries like the United States, therapy of one MDR patient can run in the order of half a million dollars. Um, and even with drug-sensitive TB, we're still talking about six to nine months of, of therapy. Um, and TB drugs, just like uh, the problem with HCV, can interact with the ARV, so therefore concomitant therapy of um, both TB and HIV can become very problematic. Um, the second or third point that I think is really important to realize is the demographic, the socioeconomic demographics of TB. TB is probably the quintessential disease of poverty. Um, and really that's um, one of the main reasons why TB, developing new TB therapeutics has been so problematic. There really is no commercial incentive for the normal um, process of the commercial development apparatus to, to get involved in TB drug development. The return on investment just isn't there. Um, and in fact, many of the pharmaceutical companies that have been involved um, in partnership with uh, developing new TB drugs have actually pulled out of this arena over the past couple of years. Um, so that, in, in fact, from that perspective, it's gotten even worse. So the, the lack of commercial incentives, in fact, um, for developing new TB therapeutics, which, which really are very much needed, has been um, probably the main reason for the existence of the organization like the TB Alliance or the so-called not-for-profit product development partnerships. Um, and one of the key elements of the not-for-profit product development partnerships is in fact that everything that we develop has to be both affordable and available to those in need. Um, how, how do we do that? Um, it's really through the support of organizations like Australia's Department of Foreign Aid and Trade, Foreign Assistance and Trade, um, through USAID, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UK DFID. Um, it's really through their um, uh, willingness to support the R&D that, in fact, we then can have control over that development to actually then influencing the cost of the therapy once it is approved. And so just to give you a rough idea before I turn it over to Dan, um, that for a regimen like PAMZ, the cost savings, if you compare it to what's available today, will be about, for MDR patients, about 90%. So we'll be getting down to about 10% of the cost of therapy of what it was before. And that's, not even, that's just for the cost of drugs, not mentioning the healthcare system costs, which are even greater in terms of the burden on most of these societies. So um, I, I just wanted to highlight that before Dan goes into um, the, really the science and the clinical data behind the trial and what we hope to achieve um, actually with the phase three um, uh, registration study that we'll be about to start. Thanks a lot, Mel. And uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to have a chance to give you a summary of the phase 2B, 2B study uh, of the regimen PAMZ. Um, I'll be presenting the details of this uh, later this afternoon at 4.30 in Plenary 2. Welcome you to come to that. First, let me give you a little bit of background about the trial. So the regimen PAMZ, it consists of three oral drugs given once a day. So the PA stands for PA824, a new drug in development. M is moxifloxacin, an antibiotic. And P, uh, Z is, pure, or Z is pyrazinamide, which is uh, a traditionally used um, uh, TB therapy. This regimen and the way we're developing it is really a new paradigm in drug development. Um, because this regimen does not include any of the traditional drugs used for drug-sensitive TB, it can be used in patients with both drug-sensitive and what's traditionally called multi-drug resistant or MDR TB. So we're in the trial treating both types of patients. So this study, which we call the MC002 study, tested PAMZ in both drug-sensitive and MDR patients for eight weeks of therapy. We enrolled approximately 200 patients in eight sites across South Africa 
and Tanzania, and we included uh, HIV co-infected patients uh, as well. The key aims were to, again, evaluate the safety and effectiveness of, of this regimen, which again is given once orally uh, in this study over eight weeks. Now, as far as the results, we basically found that PAMZ killed more bacteria cultured out of the sputum of TB patients uh, than the standard therapy. And the standard therapy for drug-sensitive TB is four, four drugs, at least given for the first two months, which tend to go under the, the label HRZE, the, the code names for the four drugs and the regimen. Um, it also killed the bacteria faster and probably the best summary statistic is if we look at the number of patients that had no TB that could be cultured out of the sputum at the end of eight weeks. So they were culture negative at eight weeks uh, in liquid culture. Uh, with the PAMZ regimen, that was 71% were culture negative at the end of eight weeks versus only 38% in the, the control group with the standard HRZE therapy. So that was almost twice as many patients uh, had no TB in their sputum at the end of the eight weeks. The patients with the MDR TB had very similar results. It was a smaller number, they did well. One note to make is that while both drug sensitive and drug resistant patients can be treated, treated with this regimen, it is only suitable for some of the MDR patients, those that are sensitive to the drugs in the regimen, which is what we enrolled in the study. 20% of the patients were HIV co-infected. They did just as well as any, everybody else. A statistical analysis did not show any difference. They had no different rate of, of adverse effects. Now, as Mel mentioned, again, this can be quite a change in the paradigm for shortening and simplifying drug therapy, both for the drug-sensitive and the drug-resistant patients, particularly for drug-resistant patients. Currently, they require five to seven drugs given over a two-year time period with the first six months, including daily rejection, injections. Um, the PAMZ regimen, which we'll take forward into a phase three study, could reduce that to six or even four months of three oral medications. A huge difference in uh, you know, pill burden, um, sort of the economic costs, the help to the families, the patients, uh, you know, less time out of work, more time with their families, um, and to the healthcare system, a potential you know, large reduction in price. Going to a four-month regimen for drug-sensitive patients cuts down the amount of time by 30%, and hopefully more patients will fully comply with the regimen, so you'll have less drug resistance developing over the long run. So, uh, and also being compatible with um, antiretroviral drugs. So as far as um, you know, what this could mean, again, as I said, it could be reduce the costs for MDR therapy potentially by 90% in many parts of the world from what it currently is. Now for next steps, we're taking this forward into a full phase three study to look for a complete relapse-free cure uh, with the PAMZ regimen. We're starting later this year a study that'll be 1,500 patients in about 15 countries, one five countries, um, and about 50 sites around the world. Um, we aim to enroll as many HIV uh, co-infected patients as possible. Uh, we're, we're being fairly liberal in the, the entry criteria, down to a CD4 count of, of 100. Um, and uh, look forward to starting that. And let me just finish off, I'd just like to also thank the, uh, particularly the patients that enrolled in the study, um, as well as our investigators and the donors that men Mel mentioned to help make the study possible. Thank you. Pass this back. Thank you, Mel and Dan. So we've heard three trials that certainly herald um, a potential new era for treatments of hepatitis C uh, TB and co-infection for both of these diseases with HIV, with regimens that are, that are shorter, simplified, and better tolerated. So we'll open the floor up now to questions. I'd ask you everyone to introduce yourself um, first. Um, we have about 15 minutes, and there'll be a volunteer who could potentially carry the mic um, for me. Okay, thank you. So 
uh, in front here first. Yeah. Yes, I have a question for both um, Dr. Molina and Dr. Sokalski. Uh, first for Dr. Sokalski, it sounds like um, the ritonavir that's included in the combination pill could potentially be um, be difficult for for, pe for for clinicians, I guess, to, to manage if they're used to using ritonavir-based regimens um, for HIV therapy. It sounds like in this study it meant they didn't have to take additional ritonavir, but in some cases ritonavir is already in the protease inhibitor pill, and how do you envision that working? Please introduce yourself. Oh, Liz Heilman from HIV and Hepatitis.com and AIDS Map. Yeah. Sure. Well, so the question pertains Sorry. to. Uh, we need that one right up here. Well, I'd like to stay up there. Um, yes. You don't need it for the questions. No, it's, okay. it's such a small room. Okay. So the question pertains to drug interactions, and certainly whenever we're treating hepatitis C and HIV co infection, one needs to take into account the interactions of the hepatitis C regimen. <clears throat> and that of the HIV treatment regimen. One thing to keep in mind is that the treatment for hepatitis C is a self-limited course of typically 12 weeks. So we're not talking about lifelong therapy, we're talking about treatment that is curative in its attempt. So the time we have to worry about interactions is relatively short. The, the second issue is that what we've learned is that for all drugs for hepatitis C, we need to do a full and complete drug-drug interaction evaluation in healthy volunteers prior to testing in HIV infected persons. So in this case, there has been an extensive program to look at the three drug combination and a number of different antiretroviral regimens. And while there will be some drugs that are not likely to be compatible, uh, what we saw in this protocol was that uh, one of the HIV protease inhibitors, Azanavir, was in fact uh, able to be combined, as was Altegravir, and we're getting ready to enroll part 1B, which will put patients with Darunavir or Tonavir on as well. So I think these are manageable and need to be considered in any time we're looking at co-treatment. <coughs> You can keep the microphone there, it's fine. I'm Sophie Scott from ABC, with a question for um, Dr. Spiegelman. Um, how significant a, a breakthrough are the results of, of the trial, the TB trial that you're releasing? How significant is it in the fight against TB? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be very significant in that if we can short, you know, TB therapy uh, for, has not been shortened for about 50 years. So the ability to crack through the six month time frame and, and then get down at least initially to four and then we hope even shorter um, will have a significant impact. We, we've done some economic studies that show even the cost of therapy um, both for the patient, for the system, et cetera, in the last two months is very significant. There's a fair amount of dropouts. Um, so if you look at what has classically been defined as the drug sensitive population that should have a significant impact um, if you look at the drug resistant <coughs> population, it's truly a game changer in the sense of if you can simultaneously bring cure rates from 50% to over 90%, shorten therapy from over two years down to four to six months, decrease costs by 90%. Um, right now in the MDR field, I think we have probably only about 15% or so of the patients in the world even being treated. And a lot of that is due to the resource constraints and the inability to reach the patients um, and to afford the therapies, uh, both in the healthcare system and the, on a patient level. So this would truly be a game changer. Um, we have, in the background, not for today's discussion, um, even newer regimens that would have a much even bigger impact down the road, both in terms of shortening therapy and also much broader uh, applications to all TB patients. And what about the effect, if you, if you can get TB under control, what effect would that have given it such a large killer of people with, with HIV AIDS? Um, well, clearly, um, you know, TB is, as I mentioned, the big killer of HIV patients. And our ability to treat them and to treat them simultaneously, similar to the, the issues with HCP, is going to be a big factor. Um, so clearly that this would be a tremendous advance. And also there's some data that HIV patients may die quicker, et cetera, so being able to um, do that. Uh, so it, clearly the, the impact will certainly be at least as large on the HIV co-infected population as the non-HIV co-infected population. Um, you know, obviously, ultimately, we need to have also simultaneously improve, simultaneous improvements in both diagnostics um, and, you know, the ultimate of 
actually have any effective prophylactic vaccine, et cetera. But, you know, if we look at what's really going to be expected over the next couple of years, um, you know, we're not going to have that magic bullet vaccine in the next two or three years. Uh, yeah, it's behind. It's you. Okay. Just one question for Dr. Malayam, uh, Pam Harris and Solomonetsky. How important is it that this uh, dual combination uh, effectively cures or presently cures all HCV genotypes? Well, uh, in, in fact, actually, as I mentioned, so first of all, it's a pan-genotypic uh, drug. It, it, it is active against most genotypes. Okay. So one, two, three, four, actually. That's the, the value of the, of the regimen, it, that it is effective in, with all genotypes, and also there is no drug-drug interactions with the HIV drugs. So you don't have to worry about you know, drug interactions or adverse events because of these combination of drugs for HCV and HIV. And the fact that you can treat all genotypes is also uh, uh, of interest because you don't have some issues that some of the early drugs had in terms of activity only on genotype 1 and not on 2 or 3. Here, that's a, a regimen that is active on all genotypes so far that have been tested. Just a very quick question. How, um, how persistent and how adhered are patients to regimens that contain interferon? I understand interferon is almost unacceptable. Well, you know, the, the, the problem with interferon is that you have adverse events during treatment, after treatment, and is, it's an injectable drug. So you have also the issue of injections once a week with interferon. So if you can get rid of interferon, and a lot of patients and physicians also would like to give their patients an all oral treatment. And that's what we have today with the new drugs. May I ask doctors, one? Um, only three patients did not achieve biologic response that was durable. How long was your follow-up? So the follow-up the follow thus far has been out to uh, 12 weeks in the 12-week treatment group, and we were presenting data out to four weeks in the 24-week treatment group, although uh, 20 of those 31 patients have actually been followed out past 12 weeks, and the responses have been durable. One thing we've learned in this era of hepatitis C treatment is that if there's no virus detected 12 weeks after stopping the course of therapy, it is highly unlikely we will see the same virus reemerge with respect to a what we call late relapse. So the, we do believe these are virologic cures of these patients. So there will be more follow-up. In fact, the, the patients will be followed to 48 weeks before we conclude follow-up in this trial. Gentlemen, the live blue shirt behind you. Uh, um, Ed Sussman with the uh, web page today for Dr. Everett. Um, your study only uh, goes out for two months, um, you're, uh, and you had a 71% uh, um, functional cure of the uh, of your patients. Have you are you going to continue testing this phase 2B study out to for six months? And if you're going to, have you actually had patients who have done that? Yeah. So this study, this phase 2B study that gave two months of therapy, we're not considering that a full curative course. So all of these patients went on to a complete course of TB therapy afterwards. So there's no way of really following those people up to see when somebody first becomes negative, say at four weeks or eight weeks, um, it's not clear if you stop therapy whether they might relapse or not. That's really the, what's needed in phase three. So in phase three, we'll treat for either four, week, four months or six months. We'll actually follow the patients for two whole years. Uh, I, I wish we could only follow them 12 weeks. <laughs> but um, for TB, you need at least one year, if not two years of follow-up to say that people have durable or relapse-free cures. So that's really what phase three is all about. You get treatment out to a certain period of time. Or are you, have, you, have you stopped the treatment? Yeah, the, the experimental treatment is only eight weeks. Then they go back to their national TB program, and uh, there are different choices, but they're really treated with conventional therapy. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Majumdar if you could expand, expand somewhat on your comments on these, uh, uh, what these trials mean to the, uh, HIV, the HIV world is, which uh, um, 
hepatitis world, TB world, or, or you know, just expand on your your comments on this on what the studies mean. So I think I think for hepatitis C, um, we're seeing. Uh, the emergence of a huge pipeline of drugs that are um, without interferon, which is the injectable, which does have um, delivery issues as well as uh, adverse effects. Um, similarly with TB, um, there has not been development uh, in terms of drugs for a long period of time, as Mel mentioned, and uh, the results that are coming through now are quite promising um, in, in the notion that we need to shorten treatments um, and also target drug sensitive and drug resistant tuberculosis, which um, are huge deaths for people living with HIV, but also um, people without HIV, uh, TB is, is a huge infectious disease. Um, so we'll move on to more questions. Is there anyone else apart from you? Okay, yeah, no, uh, we'll at the back, Nick, yep. Uh, my question is for Mel. I'm oh, sorry, Nick, Chandler, to you. One of the debates at the moment have WHO around Okay, um, I hope I heard the question well, so correct me. Um, so uh, one element of what we do is, is realistically run more on, in a sense, a biotech, a small company model, um, which means that we, I, th I think, in, and that's been documented in some studies, um, especially policy cures, that in fact we have a more cost-effective way. I mean, if you look at even bringing the PAMC regimen forward, um, we have gotten to where we are today, which is beginning phase three, on the order of about total of $50 million. Which, you know, if you look at developing drugs, that, that's pretty, or three drug regimen through beginning of phase three is uh, pretty remarkable considering the, the costs that are usually associated. Um, so I, I think the mechanism of how we work the R&D process is very efficient. Um, in, in terms of later on as far as um, making sure that the products really are affordable, the fact that we de-risk the development for anybody who then gets involved on the commercialization side has a huge impact on our ability, especially in the poor countries of the world, um, to really dictate that in fact this will wind up being cost plus, um, more on a generic model. Um, and realistically, virtually all small molecules are, you know, at scale, especially when you have millions of patients, um, can be produced for literally pennies a pill. So when we get to, even if it requires four months of therapy, total cost of goods is very small. And when you add on the uh, sort of generic profit margins for the developing countries, um, you, you have very affordable prices. So just to expand on that, uh, to the hepatitis C front, I'll ask um, Professor Sulkowski, so what's um, the next steps in then expanding uh, trials like this to low and middle income countries where the, the burden of hepatitis C and co-infection is highest? Um, so, so, the, so the question relates to really the global problem of hepatitis C, and this is really an area that has in many places not been fully evaluated. The estimates from WHO are between 170 uh, to 200 million people infected with hepatitis C. We think there are roughly 7 million who have HIV and hepatitis C co-infection. And the distribution of hepatitis C infection is truly global with large endemic infection found in places like Egypt and North Africa, as well as in Southeast Asia. And we also see different strains of hepatitis C around the world, whereas in the United States and in Europe, we see genotypes one, two, and three. We see genotype four predominantly in uh, North Africa. We see genotype three in other parts of the world, uh, such as India and Pakistan. And what this means is it will take a 
more global approach to try to find therapies that are uh, pan-genotypic, hopefully where we don't have to do genotype testing. Because the other issue backing up is there's a tremendous amount of work to be done on diagnostics, that is getting patients diagnosed with antibody testing, confirming infection right now requires uh, RNA testing for hepatitis C RNA, and that's a challenge. And then would also require strain-specific identification or genotyping. These are major hurdles uh, which also need to be overcome. So that is the, uh, the goal for a, a regimen that uh, is active against all strains in which you can get, do away with some of the baseline testing. But there is a, a huge global problem that we really haven't even touched. Jackie Peake from ABC News. This is a question for Dan Everett. With, with your trials, uh, just in, in lay terms, can you explain what the patients, particularly those with HIV co-infection, actually experienced on, on this trial and, and how effective it was? So the patients with, say, HIV co-infection would continue on whatever antiretroviral therapy they were taking at the start of the study or if they were discovered newly to be infected after a period of a few weeks, could then go on whatever the doctor taking care of them thought they should be on. They would then just be like any other patient in the study uh, who would be taking you know, one of the courses of therapy, coming back to the clinic essentially every week, and they would bring with them uh, sputum they would cough up overnight, save in a pot and put in a cooler bag, uh, you know, get a new week's full of, full of medication and then be evaluated by the, the staff there for any adverse effects. Um, we then, you know, in analyzing the data, we look at all the patients together and then look at the HIV infected patients and everybody else and essentially found, you know, no differences in how well people responded in terms of clearing the bacteria out of their sputum. Uh, or any of the adverse uh, events. So um, I, I think the experience was probably very similar to the HIV infected versus not, other than clearly people with HIV infection had to be taking their antiretroviral medication. And there was no, no need to adjust doses or make any changes. Can you just take us through the numbers again and what, how effective it was in airing TB out of the patients? Right, so the, easy, the easiest sort of number is to look at are at the end of eight weeks, how many you're not able, how, how many are culture negative, meaning if you played out, you know, culture the, um, the sputum, you cannot grow any, any bacteria, and about twice as many were culture negative with the PAMZ regimen as with the traditional regimen. So about 71% were culture negative in the PAMZ regimen, and only 38% were culture negative with the traditional regimen. Can I just be a pain, uh, just get you to yeah. explain it in lay terms, because our viewers may not understand what culture negative means. Okay. So in lay terms, just the okay. numbers on sure. how many were able to clear. Yeah, so, so these, just to try to explain a little bit better. So these are patients with pulmonary TB, meaning that it's in their lungs, which is the most common traditional, there, there are other places that TB can infect. So they have pulmonary TB, which causes a lot of inflammation. So typically they cough up a lot of thick sputum mucus from deep down in the lungs, and it's filled with the tuberculosis bacteria. And the best way in a trial to figure out how well somebody's doing, <clears throat> whether the drugs are working, is to, again, collect that coughed up mucus from the lungs, the sputum, uh, it's something that we collect it overnight, so you'll end up with sort of a pot of it. And then actually put it in you know, a Petri dish with uh, auger culture that lets it grow. And then um, depending on, you know, you do ways of diluting it out, and you could actually count how much is growing. There's a way of quantifying it. And then we can look over the period of one week, two weeks, three weeks, up to eight weeks, how much less you're able to grow out in the cultures. And the ideal is to get where nothing grows. It's completely negative. So you've, you've at least cleared all of the tuberculosis that you can grow out of, out of the sputum, out of the mucus. Does that help? I know, but can I, if, if possible, yeah, we should explain. Just discuss through the numbers again, but without using a term like 
t uh, culture negative I think, I think we might, we might Our viewers won't understand. So, the gentleman at the back. Hi, I'm Bobby Ramadan from Citizen News Service, CNS. So, um, very, very excited to hear about this study, uh, particularly because of the potential public health impact. Uh, my just quick question is that from HIV prevention research, we have learned a lot that uh, uh, social science research should go along as the clinical science research moves, so that when the, uh, re the, your scientific research ends, we, uh, there is very slight, very little delay, like we can roll out the product as fast as possible to the people who need it in, in countries, like programs, etc. So can you please tell us more about the social science uh, research that is going on, but uh, implementation science, translation research, or anything like that? Is that for us or for TV? Yeah, for TV. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think clearly there's a huge amount of ongoing work. I mean, if you look at number one, the issue of stigma. Huge issue in, in the world of TB is the fact the stigma that's associated with infection, and the faster one can get past the issue of infectiousness and getting the sputum, this goes to the issue of what Dan was talking about, what are the benefits of clearing sputum, so to speak. Part of that benefit is how long are you in a position to, commu to be communicable in a sense of spreading disease to others, that impacts stigma and all of that. So that's one whole area that we can spend a huge amount of time on in terms of de decreasing that. The economic issues of when people can get back to work, you know, the, and again, a fair amount of data on the, that we've done um, on the issue of what are the economic consequences of having to be treated and be sick for so long with people out of work um, in situations that are very borderline to begin with, and that ability to get back to work and to be, you know, and from an economic and a personal family point of view are also huge in terms of the societies that involved with, with TB. Um, so, and, and then clearly uh, in terms of children, another huge area because clearly if a parent um, has active TB and is coughing, guess who gets infected very, very easily? And then you get into a whole issue of then the, the care and what happens with children with TB, which, which is the subject of a, a whole other area of investigation that we could talk about. So th there really are huge ramifications of what benefit of, of better TB therapy could mean on, on all sorts of different societal aspects. So one more question. Can I ask one yep. Yeah, hi, I work for the Thai newspaper in Nigeria. And um, investigation revealed that 20% of HIV uh, infected persons die as a result of um, TB. And um, it was also found out that uh, most of these, they have this multi-drug resistance, and that is what, what killed majority of uh, HIV uh, infected patients in Nigeria. Can you please explain more of multi-drug resistance? Uh, yeah, <laughs> try, try that in two seconds or less. Um, yeah, so by definition, multi-drug resistant TB is TB that's resistant to two of the, of, of the used drugs uh, for treating TB. Uh, called isoniazid and rifampicin. By definition, that's called multi-drug resistant TB. The reason that it's gotten so much press is because once you fail with those two drugs, there is so little left in terms of good therapies because of the lack of new drugs um, that that's almost considered a death sentence for so many patients, and especially with an underlying immunodeficiency such as HIV. Uh, there's nothing magic about multidrug resistance, frankly. It's just the fact that there has been so few new drugs that once you fail the first-line therapy, it's really a very dire situation in general. Um, but clearly what we're beginning to show is that there's nothing special about it. If we can come up with new drugs, then the fact that somebody has multidrug resistant TB doesn't really matter because there's not cross-resistance to the new drugs that we're developing. Um, and therefore that, in a sense, ultimately will do away with the whole distinction between whether it's drug-sensitive or multidrug-resistant TB or extensively drug-resistant TB, and we'll be able to simply roll out a new simple therapy to treat everybody. So that, that's part, you know, short answer. Thank you. Actually, we do have some more time, so question for the back. Sure, I just wanted to ask about uh, pricing on the hep C side, given that we're talking about combinations of newer drugs that are on patent, and there's already been a lot of attention, particularly with subalmium and pricing, even in places like Europe. Um, please introduce yourself as well. Sorry, Brian Collins, or UAE. Well, I mean, you're 
you're bringing up a very important issue is the access to treatment. And um, as you mentioned, so first has been approved in a number of countries, but its price is yet to be defined in some of them. Um, what's good about the combination I will present this afternoon is that ribavirin, on the other hand, is a generic drug. So the cost of these drugs is not uh, uh, expensive, it's not high. So, uh, you know, you might consider this combination because you only have a new uh, agent uh, in the combination and you, you can achieve a pretty high rate of uh, success. Um, you know, then it has to be a discussion with uh, the payers, with the health authorities to, to see, you know, what would be the pricing of these new agents and what would be the cost. We, we, we talk now about the cost for cure since we now, we, we, we know we can cure HCV pretty readily with the new combinations we have available. We have a number of combinations that are uh, available more in the future. So we will have also to probably uh, decide on which combination to use, not only on uh, their efficacy, their safety, but also their cost. And so cost is now one of the issues in the near future to define which combination are we going to use in our patients. Questions? Okay, thanks very much.